Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, welcome. My name is Kevin Schofield. <coughs> I'm here to introduce and welcome Poe Bronson. He's visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series today. He's here today to talk about his new book, Nurture Shock, New Thinking About Children. In a world of modern, involved, caring parents, why are so many kids aggressive and cruel? Where is intelligence hidden in the brain and why does that matter? Why do cross-racial friendships decrease in schools that are more integrated? Poe Bronson and his co-author Ashley Merriman argue that when it comes to children, we've mistaken good intentions for good ideas. They demonstrate that many of modern society's strategies for nurturing children are in fact backfiring because key twists in the science have been overlooked. Bronson and Merriman move parenting out of the realm of folklore and into the realm of science and reveal what decades of studies teach us about the complexities of raising happy, healthy, self-motivated kids. Poe Bronson is the author of five books, including the bestsellers The Nudist on the Late Shift and What Should I Do With My Life? He's written for television, magazines, and newspapers, including Time, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and for NPR's Morning Edition. He's currently writing regularly for The New York <coughs> Magazine and for The Guardian in the United Kingdom. After the talk, uh, Poe will be happy to sign copies of his books. And in fact, in the back of the room, we're uh, fortunate to be selling several of his books. So if you want to pick up this one or uh, some of his other ones, we've got them in the back. Please join me in welcoming Poe to Microsoft to discuss his book, Nurture Shock. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so I have a daily column at Newsweek.com now, so not doing stuff for New York Magazine or Time anymore, kind of across the street. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you a little tease of the book, but my book, you can read it in three hours or three and a half hours, less time it takes the Seahawks to demolish the Rams. So, and I, and I want to talk off the book because I'm going to trust your guys' intelligence and I can talk about a couple social ideas driven by statistics, I think, have a deeper and broader meaning, and I can sort of get a chance to get this message out today. But I want to give you a tease of the 10 distinct uh, scientific explorations that uh, have been going on uh, in the social sciences in the last uh, 10 years. And uh, so the easiest way to do this is go through the table of contents. And this is going to sound a little bit like um, Oscar nominations. You can pick your favorite. Uh, the inverse power of praise. Sure, he's special, but new research suggests if you tell him that, you'll ruin him. It's a neurobiological fact. Actually, the Oscar thing was funny because this is a science of praise. Many of you have read this stuff from New York Magazine. But one of the things I didn't mention in the chapter was about uh, the time the Oscars went from saying, and the winner is to, and the Oscar goes to, because they didn't want to de-emphasize the fact that some people had lost and some people were winners, and so they changed their term. Uh, the lost hour. Around the world, children get an hour less sleep than they did 30 years ago. The cost, IQ points, emotional well-being, ADHD, and obesity. Why white parents don't talk about race. Does teaching children about race and skin color make them better off or worse? Why kids lie. We may treasure honesty, but the research is clear. Most classic strategies to promote truthfulness just encourage kids to be better liars. The search for intelligent life in kindergarten. Millions of kids are competing for seats in gifted programs in private schools. Admissions officers say it's an art. New science says they're wrong 73% of the time. 72.6% actually. The sibling effect. Freud was wrong. Shakespeare was right. Why siblings really fight. The science of teen rebellion. Why for adolescents, arguing with adults is a sign of respect, not disrespect. And arguing is constructive to the relationship, not destructive. Can self-control be taught? Developers of a new kind of preschool keep losing their grant money. The students are so successful, they're no longer at risk enough to warrant further study. What's their secret? Plays well with others. Kevin mentioned this. Why modern involved parenting has failed to produce a generation of angels. And why Hannah talks and Alyssa doesn't. Despite scientists' admonitions, parents still spend billions every year on gimmicks and videos hoping to jumpstart infants' language skills. What's the right way to accomplish this goal? So I'm always asked, 
what's our favorite chapter. And the truth is, I think you guys understand this experience as well. My favorite thing is what I was just, what I just wrote and what I'm just researching now. So I want to talk off book about, uh, tell a story sort of two statistics and um, <clears throat> try to seed some, I seed some, I think, some important ideas that maybe you guys can pass on into your community. And one has to do with um, the notion of uh, uh, snowballing comparative advantage in children's lives. And the way to talk about this is about the phenomenon of redshirting kindergarten. Today's incoming class of kindergartners that started you know, uh, last week in half the country, a couple weeks ago, the rest of the half of the country, is the oldest incoming kindergartner class uh, we've ever had. And this sort of seems bizarre. Why would they be older? Um, you know, when you go to the theme park, the roller coaster sign says you must be this tall to get on the ride. And it sort of should be similar to that like in kindergarten. But in fact, uh, the number of kids who've been redshirted, which are basically going to kindergarten at six rather than five, you could think of it that way, uh, in 1980 was at 10 percent, and uh, a few years ago was at 20 percent, and it seems to be going up. I was last week in uh, Connecticut, where uh, thanks to everybody reading Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell's wonderful book, which I loved, one parent said she was the only parent who did not redshirt her kindergartner, uh, destroying any advantage you get from being a little bit older than the other kids, because if every kid's six, then you don't get any advantage. So. Uh, and, and I also attribute this to uh, my friend Liz Wiles' article in the Sunday New York Times Magazine in 2007, which also covered a lot of this science. And a lot of freaked out parents I knew decided they should hold their kid back uh, a year and not start them till older. And it seems that no parent wants their child to be the runt of the litter. They don't want them to be the youngest kid at school. And there's a lot of sort of uh, gerrymandering going on. And there, it's no surprise when a kid starts kindergarten that a kid who's five years and 11 months old is going to be cognitively and socially ahead slightly than a kid who's four years and 11 months or five years and one month old. The question is, does it wash out over time? Or does this comparative advantage uh, hold on or even gain and snowball in some way? And uh, the best available research at the time, the research that was relied on by Liz Weil and by Malcolm Gladwell, was this Bedard study out of UC Santa Barbara, which was a terrific job at looking at this thing. And it said that, yeah, and it looked at it uh, in many countries, and it looked at it and it said, you know, the kids who are oldest, uh, by the time they're in eighth grade, they're still hanging on to advantage. In fact, the advantage might even be, be increasing. They're getting a four to eight point gain. Uh, from, for being older, for being like the oldest in class over the youngest in class. And, uh, uh, and that idea, uh, that's what's driving what's going on in Connecticut right now. And some of you may also have been struggling with this decision in your lives as parents and what you've done. Uh, what's important to know is that a new study came out this summer from the National Bureau of Education, uh, or sorry, National Bureau of economic resource, I'm sorry, NBER, I can't remember the acronym, I apologize. But they got every American birth certificate from 1989 to 2001, every single kid. And they noticed something, which is that <clears throat> affluent parents don't have their babies at the same time of year as low-income parents. And it's not, it's not so simple as it being kind of like this. Uh, it, there's kind of these waves that work throughout the year. But every single year from 1989 to 2001, you could see this trend. And it was making a sort of 2% difference month to month in what was going on. Now, they don't know why this is the case. They've been looking at this very hard. There were theories that it was about uh, temperature in the summer affecting fertility. And some people can afford air conditioning and other people can't. And that didn't seem to work. And then they were looking at um, uh, vacation schedules and when people can conceive kids. And that didn't quite wash out either. And they're thinking maybe there's some gaming of the system. Maybe parents understand that it's good to have your kid older, so they're conceiving at a certain times of year. But that doesn't really, we don't really know why this is the case. But we do know the kids who are doing better in eighth grade turn out not to be doing better because they're older. They turn out to be doing better because they're statistically more likely to come from an affluent family. And that alone washes away half of the 4 to 8% difference between the oldest and the youngest kid, say, in eighth grade. The other 
uh, portion there seems to wash away when you account for how much school the kids have been to. And older kids, you know, when you start kindergarten, you start in September. But when you start nursery school, you might start on your second birthday or your preschool at your third birthday. And some kids have been in school longer than other kids, and if they're older, they actually were going to preschool longer. And the result of that is some comparative advantage they get when they start kindergarten. And when you put all these pieces together, it pretty much washes away. The, the gain from being the oldest kid in eighth grade is now about, look to be about only 1% over being the youngest kid. And if you think about the best thing for a child's brain is to put them in kindergarten and to stimulate their brain and challenge their brain, uh, you have this unfortunate circumstance that a lot of people read this science and took the early adopter position where they, they gambled on the correctness of the science and perhaps they're maybe not better off for it overall. But there's another aspect of this, which is that, and Liz Weil and Gladwell both talked about this, which is the comparison to some of the Nordic countries, especially Denmark and Finland. And the idea was, if we wait for kids to start school, we start them later, because there they don't start elementary school till they're seven. And the kids are coming out all about the same. And the idea was, if you wait longer, to start school, uh, maybe we'll have less problems. But what was missing in that analysis, that interpretation, is that those countries have pretty much pretty universal preschool. In um, uh, in uh, I can't remember if it's Finland or Denmark, but 93% of all kids are in school by th age three. And what they're getting there is, in fact, the exact opposite. It's not holding them out of school that give, levels the playing field playing playing field. It's starting school earlier and earlier in children's lives that levels the playing field and that's the best thing for them. And what this really calls into question is the notion of using comparative advantage, sort of rank ordering uh, to, for your child to have a, have a perceptual difference of being a little bit smarter or a little bit stronger or a little better social skills than their classmates and thinking that that's somehow going to help them over time. It's the same mentality that was behind driving our ideas around praising kids, that we're telling kids they're great all the time, hoping to make them think that they're doing better than, than, than they really are, and that that would somehow boost their confidence. And it becomes really circumspect when we look at this sort of, uh, look for this comparative advantage to sort of be what's really going on in kids' lives rather than really driving them for their real advantages over time on their own individual trajectories. So that's one statistic. And um, the other one has to do with what SATs predict. So one of the great ideas of our day is this idea that um, we're imbalanced somehow as a society in how we value and select people for either their cognitive or their relational skills, or their whether they were, were emphasizing textbook learning too much over real life learning, or the analytic versus the creative. And uh, there's this surge in ideas that what matters are self-discipline, or emotional intelligence, or creativity, or street smarts, or practical intelligence. And no matter who's saying it, the implication here is that somehow all these sort of social-based intelligences are broadly and generally applicable while sort of textbook learning and cognitive learning is somehow more narrowly and only narrowly applicable. And uh, no matter who's saying it, uh, Daniel Goleman, Gladwell, Dan Pink, Robert Sternberg, w one of the things that they're completely relying on, the crux of the argument, there's one statistic that, that is at the source of all of this, which has to do with the fact that SAT scores don't predict college freshman GPA very well. And it's long been said that SAT scores predict the correlation is only 0.4 with freshman year GPA. And, um, uh, and uh, the idea is that you know, correlation of 0.4 in some social sciences, that would be a great correlation between any two things that you didn't think related to each other, such as uh, symmetrical ear length and finger length correlate with IQ at 0.39. That's surprising. But the SAT was designed to predict freshman GPA. Therefore, 0.4 is sort of uh, has no wow factor. It's pretty pretty modest or or underperforming predictor compared to what we think. And and what's going on is that 
Uh, the whole argument is if SAT scores don't predict even freshman college GPA, then they obviously couldn't predict much after that in time. And so something else must be what's driving what's going on. Therefore, that cracks the door open for, well, it's emotional intelligence, it's creativity, it's ambition, it's psychological constructs, it's self-control, it's practical intelligence. So there, I've never reported that 0.4 number. And I've always avoided it because I just had a real problem with it, which is uh, the kids who get A's in high school don't apply to the same colleges as kids who get B's in high school. And they might have some overlap, but when they get to college, the, the de grade you get at one college isn't the same degree of difficulty as the grade at another college. In addition, you've all been through this, unless you dropped out, you get to college and you self-select. And some kids take marketing 101 and they learn to write press releases and some take OCHEM and they burn out and there's not equal in difficulty and uh, for this these crucial problems I've never wanted to report the number the 0.4 number I thought it was unreliable even though it's been the crux of all that's going on and I've always wondered what if an economist took on this problem please thankfully it's happened so this is Chris Berry and Paul Sackett's work and they looked at, uh, they got 5.1 million grades from 167,000 students, got their SAT scores from 41 colleges, and every college that they also asked the, uh, the Educational Testing Service to send their SAT scores to. And what they were able to do was get a real apples-to-apples -apples comparison. They were looking at what kids took what course at what college the, under the same instructor the very same semester? And what were their SAT scores, looking back? And uh, with this, when you control for all the things you're supposed to control for, the correlation goes way up to 0.67. So a 67% correlation is considered bonzo in the social sciences. It's a phenomenal correlation. It's a very strong predictor. and uh, so what I'm trying to say, it's not that other variables such as uh, social skills and practical intelligence don't matter. Just a, the idea that somehow uh, something else is explaining things that were out of balance is, is called into question. That perhaps we're actually weighing the relative importance of, say, cognitive and analytic skills versus these relational skills just right. And it calls into question sort of this great movement in social science, in pop social science, to sort of uh, undermine the cognitive and analytic. I was talking with the USA Today reporter, Marco De La Cava, and he was writing an article. Dan Pink is a great friend of mine. I was just with him last week. I think his work is very important. I don't, I'm not trying to criticize my fellow writers. I'm trying to drive home the, the right ideas here. And, uh, uh, I was talking, he, Marco was writing about the notion of uh, right brain, left brain thinking and, and, and kids being more creative. And I said, look, you know, our economy is, needs innovation. And uh, we need to innovate our way out of these problems. I don't see if you hand, you know, the keys to the kingdom to some art students that they're going to create great value. They're going to create some great, maybe some great art, some great things, but a lot of the innovation, new companies, new products, new technology. My wife's a, 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 a biotech scientist. It comes from people who don't lack for analytic and cognitive skills, and that you have to have that as a baseline, perhaps plus other skills, but you can't undermine cognitive and analytic skills in our society. And uh, I hope that people understand that maybe the door is not as wide open as we've been saying it is with a lot of this pop science. And you should know, especially as it relates to, say, uh, emotional intelligence, uh, it's a wonderful theory. I loved Daniel Goleman's book when I read it. I was sold. Unfortunately, uh, he covers uh, Yale's Peter Salovey a lot in the book. And last year at the uh, APA, uh, Peter Salovey came out and uh, did, went on a tirade against Daniel Goleman. There's sort of this academic wing of emotional intelligence and sort of the popular wing. And Daniel Goleman is uh, the popular wing, and Salovey is sort of the first scientist who is trying to understand emotional intelligence. And what's happened is 
emotional intelligence is a great idea, but when you try to actually create a measure of it and then test what it predicts, uh, it's not predicting much at all. And this is true whether you're using Ruben Baron's tests of emotional intelligence or using Salovey's teams of emotional intelligence. And again, it's possible that our emotional intelligence is important. It's possible it's just social skills, and it's still important. But it's not necessarily predictive, as we would think. And uh, especially the problem is with these tests is that they're gameable. Um, if you, there's a famous test, if you, what, what, what are the purposes for a brick? And some kids who are much more logical thinkers might just say, well, you can make a wall out of it. And other kids can come up with all sorts of creative ideas, like it's a way to send a breakup note to your ex-girlfriend. But you know, if you prime kids, you give them a few examples, almost all kids will then come up with all sorts of creative answers to it. And a good test doesn't allows you to give a few sample, sample ones, and kids still are challenged to figure it out, not just give them a few samples and they go, oh, I get it. Now I understand the purpose of the test. And even Robert Sternsberg's work at Tufts University doing vast uh, work on kids for their practical intelligences is coming up with a, a class of kids uh, that isn't any, any more predictive whatsoever than simple uh, SAT in high school grades. And his does use high school grades as well. So there you go. I don't know how long have I talked. Wow. There's a couple of key ideas I hope you can take home, which is beware red shirting, beware thinking about engineering and manipulating minor comparative advantages in your kids' perception of how well they're doing versus other kids in their class. And beware this broad thrust in sort of popular thought leader ideology that there's something uh, uh, wrong with emphasizing cognitive and analytical uh, intelligences for children's success and for economic success. And now I'm hoping to turn over questions. I'm happy to talk about anything related to the book. I didn't talk about the book at all today, but that's because I thought that you were very influential people. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> yeah. Somebody, please. What specifically should I do to make my daughter successful? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that she already is going to be successful. You've done enough. Yeah. Are you sincerely asking the question or are you joking? Yeah. Yeah, please. is that the biggest challenge for gifted children, and I happen to have a family gifted child, is um, uh, perfectionism and imposter syndrome and not learning to put forward effort. Right. Do you know if there's any research to back up that claim that what happens to them is not being challenged enough? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, what I would describe the research as, as a, yeah, I was told I didn't have to, but that's good. So, but that's good. Uh, so. Uh, she, what I heard her asking was that uh, for parents and teachers of gifted children, they're being told to watch out for uh, kids who undermine or don't believe in the importance of effort and are afraid to show effort for kids who um, do imposter syndrome and there's one other perfectionism. and perfectionism, right? So. The work isn't necessarily directly on only gifted children, but the, the, the main piece that launched my book was the sort of science of praise. And it was Carol Dweck's work on telling kids they're smart. And telling kids they're smart makes them fixated upon their perception of being smart. And she was showing in short-term experimental manipulations children avoiding uh, difficult academic challenges and preferring to do easy tasks so then they would uh, maintain the image that would never get anything wrong in front of other people. And so that thrust has been looked at a lot in the social science, and has certainly seen it. And I think that in the gifted education, the idea for a long time was that whatever was driving kids to be intelligent was also somehow uh, manifesting as psychological vulnerability in some way. And I think we understand now that whatever was driving them intelligent was driving them to be intelligent. And it was our way we were talking to them, telling them that they were smart, which made them fixated upon their image of being smart. And showing effort to your peers becomes a sign that you can't cut it on your natural gifts. And 
you know, I used to, when I was at Stanford, I used to love to walk out of the statistics class after 10 minutes every Friday morning and show everybody that I could finish a test in 10 minutes and make them sweat and lord it over them and no one would ever get to see me do my homework. And of course, I'd do it in private. You know, I wanted people to see me sunbathing and playing volleyball and walking out of tests and I would do the hard work where they weren't looking. And sure enough, I'm a writer today rather than doing anything with math because math was always easy for me. And once it got hard, I didn't know what to do. Writing was always hard for me. I got C's in high school. I've never known anything but writing being hard. And I'm accustomed to that, and I think nothing of it. And I'm totally comfortable with that, and so I'm a writer today. And that, yes, that kids should be stressed. They should be challenged. They should, they sh they should give, be given honest feedback of where they are. And uh, um, perhaps we might see gifted children and gifted kids in gifted programs become less psychologically vulnerable and less risk averse when it comes to academic challenges. Yeah. Yes, please. So um, I'm looking forward to reading the book, and I'm not sure how much of the things you've covered. Um, so one of the things that I hear you saying that I definitely agree with is that as a society, we've, we've definitely gotten to where we're creating stigmas in children to the point that everyone is manipulating what we think will be success. And I really see, I used to teach GED in adult high school, so I've seen kids that were bored and probably gifted drop out of high school and things of that nature. Um, I myself, for my own family, have come across Maria Montessori, and for me personally, I, I think she was really onto something, and I know it's not necessarily for everybody, but I was just wondering if you could speak to Montessori education and really kind of the three-year age groupings or the idea of not being so specific as to what grade level people are in. Yeah, uh, so I really can't talk about scientific other than my kids go to a school where they have don't have don't use first grade, second grade, third grade, and they don't do that until they get to fifth grade, and they have different names and they can age group them, and it's, it seems to work really well. And they, my kids also went to a Montessori school. School, so I think that there's some some value in kids being placed cognitively where they belong. There's also totally separate area of the science has to do with social skills and childhood aggression and you know the average middle schooler now has 299 peer interactions per day they come home they tell you about one of them but there were 298 other ones and what we imagine that we're really this like huge presence in their lives but because of age segregated so much what things kids do they're in a sense being raised by each other and uh, and when they do that uh, social dominance uh, becomes gets spiked and the urges for social dominance increase and you see a lot more relational aggression, physical aggression, um, click formation and this kind of thing. And that by kids being exposed to kids of other ages, it's, it can actually sort of tame that down a little bit as well. But I want to say some other aspect of this about the praise which is important, which is this isn't just a philosophical thing. Um, the, the neuroscience by Robert Cloninger out of Washington University in St. Louis looking at um, uh, the, the neural circuit that uh, govern, sits atop the nucleus accumbens is showing that uh, kids who are, suggests that kids who are praised all the time aren't wiring up this sort of persistence delay of gratification circuit. And they're having less active circuits. And the idea that if you, you, know, if you reward, be it a, a kid, a grown-up, a mouse, whatever, all the time, you don't wire up this circuit. And we all know what it's like to go through periods of difficulty and how you have to keep working through it and grinding through it. And it, it goes back to Skinner. Intermittent reinforcement is what wires up that part of the brain, not constant reinforcement. And there's a sort of neurobiological basis for this that's far more than just philosophical. You, someone had a hand up here? Yeah. Use that term. Uh, was it age segregation? Yeah. Oh, uh, that just means you know the four-year-olds only hang out with four-year-olds, and the eight-year and the eight-year-olds only hang out with eight-year-olds. And they have we have uh, you know we're trying to we're, we're very afraid of uh, sort of playground aggression. So we have a lot you know playdate phenomenon and a lot of um, uh, kids doing a lot of much more age segregated activities where they're only around peers of exactly the same school year as them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and back, please. Sorry, either one is fine. You guys work it out. Hi, um, I have a kid that's uh, very precocious, so I outlier from birth physically and so on, and I find that she finds it the only way, you mentioned age segregation, the only way she can interact is to interact with people who are not older than she is. 
that one now, what kind of impact that would be? Because she acts like them until certain points where emotionally she breaks down. Yeah. Now, I wonder how does that impact her? And also, the second flip side of that is, even if you don't praise your kid, but others do, how does that impact them if you get... Okay, you get to the first point, I could conjecture but I, I'm a journalist, and I don't want to just broadly conjecture about science. Without, I want to talk about things that I understand and studied very carefully. So I apologize for not trying to blow you off, but I don't think I can answer. Secondly, is about praise from other people and constructs in society. So one of the things that people have said to me is, you know, your book is bringing all this science to child development or to parenting. You know, I'm just not sure parents should like have to think about it so hard and they should do what kind of comes naturally. And they sort of feel like this is a, as a science book, it's telling people, you know, you must do it by the book. You know, science says, do this, do nothing else. And uh, as if there were no margin of error. And but scientists do study of that. So specifically around praise, what scientists study is how much of the different kind of sort of innate construct praise, the, uh, you're so, you've got it or you don't. You're so smart, you're so creative, you're shy, whatever it is, an, an innate construct versus a process-based construct. We're being focused on specific strategies, on how hard they work, what have you. And the idea that what they find is that the tipping point is around 25%. That when they hear you're so smart or you're so great or you're so creative, more than 25% of the time, then they begin to believe in this idea, you've got it or you don't. So the margin of error in the science, that, that's the, sort of the next stage of science, is understanding where the margin of error is. So what would be good in the case of your daughter is, you know, not to be hearing that too much from other people. And I coach soccer, and I've seen this with kids, my, my kid who's the best in the league, and I, not my son, a different son, and, and I, I, don't, I tell him exactly what to work us on and what to focus on, and, other, and he gets frustrated after games, and other, other, not his parents, other parents see him frustrated and come in and say to him global praise, try to say, you're so great, you're the best player, don't worry about it. And both his dad and I have to kind of really interrupt it. Uh, he doesn't like it. He doesn't like hearing those things. And so I think that uh, it can be a problem for kids. Uh, what's really important is that your relationship be sincere and they hear sincere feedback from you so that you're a trusted person and they don't begin to hold you in high disregard. Yeah. Uh, and now behind you. Yes, please. Uh, thanks for coming and talking to us. This is a great subject. My girlfriend's a um, kindergarten teacher mm -hmm. and she teaches uh, specifically low income kids. Yeah. She's very passionate about it, and I was wondering if you have any macro trends, anything that would help her succeed. Right? Sure. Well, okay, a couple things that just pop into mind. Uh, I have something coming up on the Newsweek blog. Uh, maybe I'll put it up next week, but it's work out of Sylvia Bungay working with older kids in Oakland. But they took just off-the-shelf games that are focused on brain speed or focus on fluid reasoning. And they're just off-the-shelf games. It cost eight bucks a piece. They had these kids come in for 12 weeks, two sessions a week, uh, and they watched brain. Those who worked on brain speed watched their brain speed jump 20 points. Those who worked on fluid reasoning watched their fluid reasoning jump 20 points. And so there's an incredible amount of just uh, cognitive stimulation that you can give to, to kindergartners on a, on a game-based thing that will uh, uh, help them recover from a understimulated home environment. And why we can say this is many things in the social sciences benefit the smartest kids way more than they benefit sort of the, the, the kids who are falling behind. This is one area where the farther a kid was from behind in her work, the more they came back up to the norm. And so it was suggested that you couldn't just give these games to the brightest kids and expect that they already have the games at home. You know? The other thing has to do with sort of the wiring up of the attention networks in children's brains. And I have a chapter on, on, on self-control. I would look for my friend uh, Paul Tuff's article also on the same topic coming out in the Sunday Times Magazine, maybe this weekend or next weekend, and which covers some science of this. But the neural networks of attention uh, uh, can be trained up just like cognitive. And, and, and there's two ways to look at that. One has to do with um, uh, background cues. So it's like Simon says, a red light, green light, or uh, jumping and jumping and jumping, and, and then the music stops and you have to stop. And you have to listen to the music in the background. And so that's one way where kids can attend their brains to background cues. The other is through, and still, they still do this work in kindergarten in, I went and watched it like in um, Neptune, New Jersey, which is where Bruce Springsteen grew up. The, uh, 
It has to do with um, making kids non-distractible, right? There's two ways a kid can avoid distractions. One is to be very obedient. They know the distractions there. They really want to do it, but they're obedient, so they don't act on that. The other way to do it is to see, is to see if you guys would recognize this feeling from your own work, but is to be so absorbed in what you're doing that the distractions seem sort of piddly, and it's just not very tempting. And children uh, can sustain activity much longer when they inhabit a role, a character, in extended mature pretend play. So it has to do with getting kids to do uh, extended mature play. We give them scaffolding to extend their play scenarios and they can, so they can play for 30 minutes to 90 minutes at a time. And they become so absorbed in their roles, it's not like every three minutes they want to do something new. And they get in the habit and they understand this sort of deep feeling, and they uh, can avoid lots of distractions. So this work, there's two dimensions of this curriculum called Tools of the Mind, uh, which is a research-based curriculum. It's not a mass-manufactured curriculum. Give a lot of insights into especially what low-income children uh, need to do for their brains and those, both those systems. Um, and that can really dramatically help them get ready for what they're going to do in first grade. Yeah. Fluid reasoning. I was talking about that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll post on Newsweek.com about that, and then that'll help explain it. Or if you email me, I'll email you. I've already written the post, so I'll email it to you. OK, so I know you had asked before, so let's go to somebody new. Yeah, sir. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, this is for anyone with precocious children in the room. There is a Yahoo group that's regional called Northwest Accelerated Learners, N-W-A-C-C-E-L, on Yahoo for parents to share their feelings about the challenges of raising these kids. So if you're looking for outside feedback locally. Great, thanks. Go. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, I was what your thoughts were. I was just you know, listening to your thoughts about red the whole concept of redshirting before. Um, you know, first I was thinking, well, why don't we, why don't we just homeschool, homeschool my kids and just take them out of this artificial you know, fish tank? Until you know, initial conditions are a little more stable later on. Mm -hmm. But so I was wondering what you think of that versus um, the trade-offs with respect to understimulation and, and so on. Okay, so the the science of homeschooling is not really a science, and it's unfortunate. We're just not, they're not there yet. And the reason is every teacher is so different. So you can make broad categorical statements about homeschooled kids have this dimension versus schooled kids have this dimension. But the variance between teacher to teacher, meaning mom to mom and dad to dad, is so great that those minor differences don't matter as much as what kind of teacher you got at home, right? So as a result, you, I could make broad statements about that, but they're not scientifically useful in any way. They don't really provide guidance. If you were doing it, you might be a great homeschooled parent. That doesn't necessarily apply to everybody, right? So that's, that's the issue there. The other thing I would, I, would, I would suggest to you, which is important to understand, is to what extent a lot of kids' achievement uh, in the early grades is a function of peer comparison. And they basically don't want to be last. And they see other kids doing things, and, and they will grind it out. They'll do better. You know, I mean, my son, uh, he would come home, and he did not want to be so bad at kickball. And he would want to practice every day after, after school. And he got really good at kickball. And he didn't want to be the worst at reading or math either. And it, was, it wasn't that he really wanted to be great at math or reading. He had never read a book he actually enjoyed but he didn't want to be worse in class. And so social comparison, peer comparison, does, those, so, that social ranking does drive a lot of what kids' achievement in those early ages. And they may not have that. They may feel incredibly safe in a home environment. And some kids respond to that. Some kids don't. That tortures and terrorizes some kids. And you can't generalize to what kind of kid you have to know whether that's actually ultimately advantageous or disadvantageous to the character of the kid. So for some parents and some kids, that might make total sense. And other kids, they actually they could like they would train them right up really fast to just send them to school a bunch of other kids. And just the plain old pride will drive them to, to actually work on it a lot better. Yeah. And way in the back with the kid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> earlier, you mentioned that there is a very strong correlation between the, the SATs and the college. The, the, the correlation is really high. 0.67. So, 
Does that mean that there is correlation even younger? So should we be teaching more formal education and more structured education even younger and younger? Should we be more focused on that as opposed to other types of education? Is the correlation strong enough that that's a... Well, I, like I was arguing with the notion that starting school earlier, as I do in Denmark and Finland, is, is does level the playing field. So, product. You okay. Level the playing field, but does that improve the final product? <laughs> product being the child. The. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 all right. Well, I just think this. You have to be. I think we're taking speaking too broadly. I think that work out of several labs that I'm following over the next you know, five to ten years is going to be able to isolate you know, what games can you buy at Target and give your kids and have them play that really does train up fluid reasoning, what really does train up brain speed, which really does train up attention systems, and which ones don't do anything for them at all. I would focus on that we're going to understand things in the sciences that will make, uh, educa could make education much more efficient if they were well distributed. Right? So it's more, much more about targeting and efficiency than just doing it more. You know? We don't know whether 100 math problems a night is comparatively that much more better than doing 50 versus 20, but we do know at least doing at least 10 is better than doing none. You know? So it's w where we find those lines and the science figures that out is what's, is, you know, what's to be determined. Yeah, uh, yeah please. Um, yeah, on the, on the issue of when to take your child out of a traditional preschool environment and put them into a, a, a standard kindergarten environment, one of the arguments in favor of that that I had heard was that children often learn, they'll just have a developmental age when they're ready to take in certain of the basic skills that they're supposed to be learning in kindergarten and first grade. And if your child is six months older than he or she might have been at their start time, then they may hit the, the moment when they developmentally get the light to turn on in their head. Oh, they have, now they can, you know, master the phonemes or you know understand basic numeracy. So the idea is not just it's that it wasn't just the relative age. Right. No. Okay. So yeah. This science is not telling anybody what to do. It's just evidence that's laid out there. For your N of 1, you must make decisions based on whatever is appropriate to your child. So what, what the art of science is saying is don't think you can gain, gain the system by gaining comparative advantage. That doesn't actually exist. There's plenty of other really good reasons to start your kid early or start your kid late based on where they are on the developmental spectrum. And that's something for each parent to decide. And, and that's, that's a distinctly separate point. Totally agree. Yeah. Uh, sir, you had in the plaid shirt. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah. Um, well, a couple of questions, I guess. For, well, first, uh, your daughter just started first grade, and she was the youngest one in her class. Mm -hmm. Maybe I feel a little better about that now, that she'll be constantly <laughs> challenged. That's what we're trying to do. So she's yeah. you know, at least three months younger than anybody else. Yeah. But uh, one of the things we focused on, and she actually did her kindergarten in Germany, is traveling a lot with the kids. And we've noticed huge developmental jumps whenever we travel, and we have you know, a really extended trip here. Have you seen any correlation with that? Do you know where that is? I haven't seen any science on that. It's a great thing. I, when I travel, it seems like it's great for my kids, but all I can say that that's true. Do you I, notice that like after a week, you notice that different interaction? It could be that they just love their time with parents traveling, and it could be that we stimulate them more than anything. I don't know. But, but I, anecdotal, anecdotal, I don't know. Yeah, could be. so I hear, yeah. Um, I just want to kind of take you to another part of the book. And yeah. Get, you know, a high level on maybe particularly the white kids lie and yeah. a bit about race, uh -huh. and maybe even the teen rebellion. I mean, kind of whatever else. Well, it would take us 45 minutes if you wanted high level. <laughs> <laughs> Pick one. OK, um, just why kids lie. So what were you curious about? And you've, it sounds like you've read it, and maybe I can get the audience up to speed. I mean, both my kids have done it. One's 12, yeah. one's 9. They mm -hmm. both do it every now and then. Honesty yeah. and integrity is pretty darn important to me. So mm -hmm. we keep instilling it. But I also know it's a pretty normal thing for kids to go through. So why do they do it, other than trying to get away with it? OK, well, kids, kids lie because they develop theory of mind. They begin to understand the notion of suspension of reality and fantasy and they and by all you know 80% of all kids will be lying by the time their their fourth birthday many kids doing it when they're two uh, we think that they grow out of it they grow into it they'll lie more often 
by the time they're five and the time they're six. What's very important is to, it, just because it's developmentally normative doesn't mean you ignore it because uh, it turns out by the time they're seven, if they're still lying, it's become a habit that will, they will deal with difficult circumstances uh, uh, consistently by using lying to sort of smooth out relationships and that kind of thing. Of the kids who are still lying at six, half will have it socialized out of them by the time they're seven, half won't and will continue to hang on to it over time. So that's looking at individual trajectories over a longer period of time. So, well, yeah, well, that's normal. It's probably not something to freak out about. I mean, the thing about, the thing broadly is that you know, 98% of teens will say lying is really is is wrong and honesty is really important. And you know, parents have, for 40 years straight have rated honesty as the number one trait they want to see in their children. But honesty is not what you number one topic, you know, around the sandbox. You know, um, and and people, if that's what's important to them, they'll look at. It. But one of the things to know is that kids do lie and parents have unreasonable expectations of honesty that's broadly true 78 percent of american parents think their teens can tell them anything the science says that the average teen is lying to their parents right now about 12 dimensions of their life out of 36 things they might lie and even the kids who lie the least will lie about five things not necessarily to get out of trouble sure but you know you mentioned a 12 year old a little different there than a nine year old but one of the things to look at is sort of the forces of autonomy the desire for independence it actually is very indiscriminate. They will re rebel against any control you have, and that can be that peaks at age 14, not at 18, and is actually stronger in an 11 and 12 year old than an 18 year old, largely because an 18 year old has carved out some independence for themselves. They don't have to like push back as much. So, so when you're getting a 12 year old, what you're getting is some things need to be none of your business, mom, and because it's psychologically emasculating to always come to your parent and think you always need help to have it worked out. And some things they need to feel like I can handle on my own because they're on a trajectory towards future independence and they're practicing. And so it's developmentally normative to see, again, to see some lying, but it does matter how we deal with it. Parents who will get lied to the least seem to be parents who set a few rules and really enforce them. Parents who set a lot of rules tend not to enforce them. They can't possibly enforce them. And those parents get lied to more. And parents who are permissive get lied to the most. Um, and uh, anyway, there's a lot more in the chapter, but yeah. Do I, do, how much time, what do I have, what's well, the deal know, here? <laughs> how people are grabbing books and going, but I'm okay? All right, yes, please. We spoke a lot about the praise aspect. Uh, what about the feedback, the not positive feedback? The you could do better, you're not good at all. What's the- Right, some, many people were raised in an environment where they were always told you could have done better. And so does the praise science somehow say that that works? Not at all. Not, not whatsoever. Um, kids need honest feedback, not, not manipulated feedback of any sort. And uh, you know, that can just undermine their sense of confidence. That's quite clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah, please. I'm a big fan of your previous books. Uh -huh. um, this one seemed very different from the previous books. I was wondering why you wrote it. Uh, yeah. What makes you an authority in this area and how much your co-author had to do with it? I don't remember you writing with co-authors before. Right. So uh, uh, I started out writing novels, then I started writing for magazines, which led me to do uh, so, sort of uh, portrait journalism and then social documentary, uh, interviewing people and telling their life stories. And, um, and now I've written a science book that happens to be about kids. And it seems like a real different change. So the, the history with Ashley is that uh, uh, Ashley helped me do some research, deep background research on some of the families I was writing about in my last book. And after we did that, um, we created a, an online resource for other journalists called the Factbook on Family, which tried to set straight the trends in reporting on American family, putting it in historical and cross-cultural context. And that was this big online thing that we won a couple awards for. And then we started blogging together, started blogging for time together. And next thing you know, New York Magazine called me and we started working together. Uh, uh, certainly, the fact that I never really, one of my weaknesses I always considered was I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time in library shelves. I like to go out and talk to real people. And, and, 
And certainly Ashley, uh, as someone who could do tons of research and that kind of thing, made it feel safe for me to read tons of scientific papers and to engage with material in an analytic way. She has perhaps less analytic skills, you know, sort of in terms of the math and that kind of thing that comes from my background. In terms of what makes us qualified, uh, I, uh, I think the evidence is on the page or it's not. I think that writing improves itself on the page or it's not. Uh, we've won four magazine writing awards now for the work, the science writing that we've done. But I had no previous experience. It was a f I won awards for the very first science piece I'd ever written. I had never done that before. But one of the advantages you get as a journalist is I wasn't raised by some scholar who was not my mentor who I had to please. I'd have to spend 10 years buying into some old disproven psychology before I could sort of look at it fresh. And because we have two minds looking at it uh, and talking all day long, Ashley lives in Los Angeles and I live in San Francisco, it's through talking about it that we see weaknesses and we see strengths and we see what to highlight and what not to work. So there you go. Uh, one more. Sir, please, yeah. Uh, I guess from the UK we've got a very the public school system very top down driven. Yeah. I guess your thoughts on moving forward with education about giving schools more autonomy versus politicians often working with outdated science in setting directions. Well, you know, I I personally couldn't agree more with the idea of decentralizing some of these things. So there's going to be more experimentation and more innovation. If I look at it just from the perspective of um, what I see coming on the horizon in the next five years scientifically, I was talking about sort of understanding very carefully what works. When a kid says they're not good at math, what's exactly going on in the brain? When exactly can you diagnose which learning disabilities and not, and what interventions work for them? There's just a whole incredibly robust spectrum of information that's coming along. And I, if I was expecting sort of that to be institutionally understood, that would be way too much socially to expect that this could somehow be digested on a high level and all schools would be in a centralized way changed to reflect this information. It wouldn't work. What has to work is you have to free schools up to understand this stuff, work with it, test it in their systems, watch that, re get that studied, get it reproduced and let that spread in much more like in an economic system to where let good ideas win out over bad ideas. Um, and I think that's, it, it couldn't be even, it's even more true in the UK than in here where uh, things are even more centralized and standardized. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, maybe there's overall a little bit better work in some of the schools there at the same time. But yeah. Okay, is that it? Great. Thank you guys so much for listening. I appreciate it.